I certainly haven't um, ever worked for the BBC, for example, so uh, in 20 odd years of acting. So um, I probably don't fit into their ideological standard of what is and isn't acceptable from an artist, or maybe I'm just to acting, who knows? To get Brexit done. Make America great again. No, no, no. This is Stephen Edgington for The Sun, and today I'm interviewing Lawrence Fox. Lawrence Fox is an actor and a commentator. We're going to be talking all about his career as an actor, what it's like working with all the woke crowd in that industry, and a little bit about the identity politics and culture crisis that's going on at the moment. Thanks so much, Lawrence Fox, for joining us. My pleasure. Thanks for having me, Steve. Okay, so let's talk about your um, career in acting. Now, you uh, made some controversial comments on Question Time earlier this year. Can you explain what the comments were, uh, why were they Why were they were controversial, and what kind of impact that had on your life? Yeah, so I was, um, I was invited on Question Time, and I didn't really think twice. I just went, yeah, sure, that sounds fun. Um, I, I kind of have enjoyed watching Question Time in the past and shouting at the TV, as I'm sure loads of people do when they're when they're looking at uh, watching the sh the show. And I went on, and um, the conversation went on to Meghan Markle and Harry. And my view was that um, it was a sort of have your cake and eat it type situation. And then an audience member who I'm told uh, was a plant because they knew roughly what my sort of take on these things was, uh, said it was racism that um, forced her and Harry from the UK. And um, I sort of sat there and went, well, she got a really nice wedding. It was a beautiful wedding, but everyone was very on board. I saw a lot of goodwill from the British public towards them both. And, you know, it was a, very, it was a, it was a beautiful service and all this stuff. So um, I said, no, I don't think it is racism. And then she said, the audience member, um, who was a lecturer in gender studies or something, or race, critical race theory or something like that, uh, at Edge Hill University. She said, um, she called me a white privileged male. She said, that's why I said it. And I said, no, that's racist to, to uh, use an immutable characteristic against somebody in a pejorative way, which is what she was doing. Um, and I said, no. That's racism. So then it all went kicked off. I mean, I, I went to bed and thought it was fine, but um, I woke up the next day and it was, I'd obviously just trod on one of the landmines, you know. And what kind of impact has that had on your acting career? Well, I've had a few warnings in nicest possible, subtlest ways, warnings about um, being quiet from, uh, from a couple of people. But you know, it all also coincided with COVID. So we'll have to see really. Um, whether it's had any uh, negative impact. I think probably uh, two or three years ago, people, uh, someone would have said to me, oh, don't worry, you'll just get loads of bad guys now. But I imagine in the new, um, in the new woke world that they, they wouldn't even want a bad guy playing a bad guy. They'd want a good person pretending to be bad, wouldn't they? So we'll have to see. And, and have you got any projects in the, coming up? Have you, you know, is there going to be a White Lines another season or something like that? I don't know about White Lines another season, but the, uh, there's a conversation going on at the moment about another job. So I, will, I can test my cancellation level um, up against that. I suppose. It's an interesting point because, you, you know, you're one of those people who f has become a, almost a martyr for free speech. And, uh, you know, you've got this kind of this, this whole image of you of being able to speak your mind and you don't hold back. But do you ever hold back? Is there a, ever a time where you think, actually, you know, I shouldn't say that? I, I, I'm learning to listen. I think, you know, this is one of the, the other things. I'm quite a speaky person. I speak in order to work out what I think often. So I'm now, I think then you're, the responsibility is to learn how to listen. But um, no, not really. I mean, I try not to. I think, you should, I think you should express yourself. And I think that it's important that we all express ourselves, you know, because God knows we have the other side of the argument shoved down our necks at, all, at all, any available opportunity, you know. And uh, you, it's important that we express ourselves because you'll get some rewriting of history takes place. Like there was a t BBC who had the worst for this constantly saying, very subtly imbuing various things. They said that a man died on, um, a man died on his way to work because the bus he was on blew up 15 years ago yesterday. And it's like, no, it was blown up by an Islamic terrorist. He was blown up and so were a lot of other people who were murdered by Islamic terrorists. Report it factually, guys. You know what I mean? And then someone tweeted beautifully um, uh, that JFK died in 1963 because the head he was using exploded. 
you know, and it's it's just like a rewriting of history. So no, I think it's uh, it's important to speak your mind, and you know, and it's important also to have a thick enough skin that when someone kicks back at you, you can take it. But usually people just kick back at me by screaming at me, and there's no argument. I don't get an argument in return. I just get really offensive anger and rage. So that just goes to show that you're winning. When you made some comments about the film 1917, you experienced a lot of pushback from various people. Uh, you were talking about, um, you, you know, the, the, how Sikhs were represented in this in this film in World War One, and you weren't very happy about that. Do you kind of regret those comments? Because you know, maybe maybe they should be represented, and and um, you know, a lot of people felt that you know you were wrong on that issue. Yeah, I think I was clumsy on that issue, but I think again, it was it wasn't it was I was speaking on a podcast, and I think podcasts are important to to explore again. You know, as you speak to learn what you think, you're going to stumble. And I did feel slightly that there was a, a tokenistic element to it. You know, you could have had a platoon of Sikh soldiers, for example, and a historian sent me a, a, um, a roundup of saying that by that point in the war, there were uh, two cavalry regiments, I think, of Sikh soldiers who, who would have all been mishmashed. But the, I think he gave me a percentage of the chances, the likelihood of bumping into a Sikh soldier at that juncture of the war. And I think, you know, OK, uh, it felt to me that we could have seen more Sikh soldiers and you would have, and then it would have had a better impact. Whereas it's sort of just by having one, I felt, oh, you've got a Sikh soldier into this to, to you know, and I felt a tiny bit tokenistic, but it happens a lot in drama. You know, you'll have uh, siblings played by different people of different ethnic origins and you're like, that's a bit jarring. You know, I, they did an all black Hamlet, didn't they? And, uh, and then they, they, and it was great, and everyone was really on board with it. And then suddenly Rosencrantz and Guildenstern turn up, and they're white. And you go, oh, okay, so now it's, you're making a political point here. So hyper racial awareness is not good for anybody. It's certainly going to be really bad for the children of the next generation because they're all hyperly racially aware. And what's that going to do for unity? So is it the issue of tokenism that kind of you know grinds you down and, and sort of makes you slightly upset, uh, rather than you know for example a black person playing a white person or or whatever it is? Yeah, black people can. It, it, it shouldn't matter what colour you are, what you play. In the same way, it doesn't. You don't need to be gay to play a gay person. You know, I mean, I'd probably struggle to be in a remake of Boys in the Hood, but you know, there we are. Um, I. I I, I don't think, I think we've come so far as a society that what, why suddenly hyper-racial awareness? I mean, obviously, you know, there's inequality in society as well, so one wants to draw attention to that, but a lot of our inequality is financial inequality. And, um, you know, those things coincide with uh, ethnic origin sometimes. It's a really important conversation to be had in society about inequality in general, but... Um, you know, hyper-racialising everyone feels not like the most positive and constructive way to have that conversation. You know, you talk a lot about cancel culture. Is it ever acceptable to cancel someone? Is there any words or phrases or statements they could say where you just think, actually, that is too far? You know, you could mention the example of the Harvard graduate who talked about stabbing people who say, uh, who say all lives matter. Some people would say that's incitement to violence. Um, and, you know, it's right that she loses her, her place on that course. Or, you know, David Starkey's controversial comments about black people and slavery. It was right that he lost those positions that he hold, held. I, I mean, I, I, I'm, uh, I, I don't believe that human beings really should have the power to judge other human beings in that way. I, don't, I, I think cancer culture is way out of control and it doesn't help... Um, it doesn't increase the cultural conversation at all. Um, I think in terms of the, the girl who um, said she was going to stab people, I think, you know, she needs to take responsibility for what she said, you know? And I think David Starkey, uh, I just, I couldn't get past the way he expressed himself personally. But I'm not walking around thinking about how David Starkey needs to be ended. You know, he, he, ha he has said some very valuable and important things. And also, you know, this context that is valuable in these situations. And, uh, you know, everyone's been locked up for four months. So there's a sort of cabin fever going on with their uh, people and, and views can be badly expressed and misconstrued. But no, I think you, yeah, I generally think the only th things that we should really hold to account are institutions. I think people make mistakes, but I think you can hold an institution to account. 
and you can encourage the cancellation of an institution, like I firmly believe with the BBC, which has gone out of control. Now, because you're such a figure uh, of free speech, and it's something that you're really passionate about, I thought I would open up to the public to give their, their, their speech and to give their minds uh, on you, and I asked them if they have any questions for you. Was it worth speaking your mind? Yes, it was. When are you running for Parliament? <laughs> Can you imagine me in Parliament? My God. Actually, no, I've watched a couple of Labour MPs recently talking in Parliament. I'm like, how the hell did you get in here? So, um, I don't know, I'm an actor. Really, I just want to be an actor. But I've suddenly been lobbed into this position of, of, of saying stuff. But no, I think, you know, hopefully people with smarter brains than me can, can operate the political landscape. Is there anyone out there who can give you a hug? I get lots of hugs. I get lots of hugs. I'm very lucky with the people that I get to hug. Are there any other actors who support you? Yes, privately, yeah. And one publicly, too, you know, so, I mean, it's very difficult because also there's this horrible thing in the world where someone actually might actually be a racist, do you know what I mean? Because you don't know, you can know someone for years and then they'll say something and you're like, what the hell? Um, so I think people are very reticent in case I suddenly sort of go all Nazi on the world or something like that. So, you know, it's fair enough. I don't, I, I don't... I, I'm someone that would vocally support somebody else if I knew them well, but each to their own, I say. Now, this question's relatively similar. This, this guy is asking, you know, it, it, do actors hold the same views as the majority of the population, but they're just sort of scared to say it for fear of the consequences? Yeah, I think probably there is a large, silent majority within show business that uh, isn't heard particularly. But, you know, they, they, you just have to look about what, you know, especially equity's treatment of me and then the, the disparity between that and the Maxine Peake situation to go, well, you know, there's th a few good reasons why we shouldn't speak our mind. So, you know, when you publicly flagellate someone like me, uh, it's not going to encourage people to, to come out and say, well, he's got a point, actually, you know. So I don't think it's controversial what I think at all. But then maybe I'm, maybe I'm mad. Do you ever get nervous before a gig? Yes, I do, yeah, I do. Not when I act, when I do music, I do. But then I'm better at acting than I am at singing. Lager or Guinness? Lager. I, had, I did a film in Ireland once, which was, um, and we drank a lot of Guinness, and uh, I've, I've noticed the effects that overconsumption of Guinness can have on your dietary system, you know, your digestive system. It's good stuff, though. Are you okay? This is, I'm quoting the, uh, the Twitter uh, follower, are you okay? Because I know you've had it tough for a while. Yeah, I am. I am okay. I am okay. I'm. Uh, I'm. I'm. If you don't, you know, if you keep standing up, you're okay, right? So, um, and I, I don't really have a choice now. So I, I have to keep going. Otherwise, um, you can't apologise to these bastards anyway, because they just take that as a sign of weakness. So uh, yeah, I'm all right. I'm doing okay. Are you going to be the next James Bond? Fat chance. I do know Barbara Broccoli though. So, uh, and I did get very close to being. You're in there. I did get very close to. I signed a pre-deal memo for the pre-deal agreement for a Bond film the, uh, years ago. So it was. Uh, I don't know. It'd be nice to have a, uh, have one of those Bonds back, wouldn't it? Roger the Chop Moore, who just can only do chops and nothing else. It's quite fun. Would you do it if they asked you? That's my question. Look, I'm also very practical. I've got two boys who need clothes and love and food and that stuff so you know i hate to like burst the bubble of only ever doing passion projects but i you know i need to make a living out of this so um yeah i, I do most things I, i'm not sure there's many parts that i wouldn't do if i if i thought that i could bring something to it do you pay your tv license no i don't i don't pay my tv license and i'm not going to pay my tv license until there's a root and branch look at the BBC and you know you get these amazing journalists like Justin Webb and and Jeremy Bowen and that that, that school who are actually show not tell re reporters and um and then you've got these out of control lunatics like Mateless and um you know who was that woman the other day who who did the same thing you know who d d deliberately misreported what uh, Darren Grimes said and then proceeded to sort of go ha ha on Twitter. And I'm like, they're out of control, these people. The, the charter is, is that you are impartial in your delivery of the news. And, you know, for the sake of a really small and angry minority of activists, we're going to lose uh, possibly the, you know, one of the best institutions we had. But I mean, it, I, I, I never pay my TV license until that's sorted out, but I don't watch it anyway. So it's a win-win.
Are you Jesus in disguise? I didn't come up with the questions. <laughs> I am Jesus, no, I wish. I wish I was, but no. And finally, what gets you out of bed in the morning? My kids and the need to uh, homeschool them and, uh, and my love for them and my desire that they grow up in a, in a, in a freer world than I did. And uh, at the moment, it's looking, it's looking hit and miss. So, yeah, my, my, I live for my children. And, um, and, you know, I've got to wake up and feed the dogs. That's about it, really. How, how is the home homeschooling going? That is, uh, someone else asked that. It's, um, it's pretty good. My, my, uh, well, my eldest son is year six, so he's gone back to school. Uh, and he's resilient and tough. And my youngest son is, um, he's really brilliant and very diligent. And um, so I, I've quite enjoyed actually, weirdly, teaching him stuff. And also he's taught me stuff. So I'm learning about apostrophes because that's what they're doing. And I've never known how to use apostrophes or how to use the ablative case either. So I'm learning these things from an eight-year-old. So I think it's been cool, but can we get them back to school now, please? Thank you. You know what I mean? Do they, do they learn it? This is a very random question, and I apologise to viewers, but do they learn languages that young? They do have a little stab at it, yeah, but there's also quite a lot of mindfulness and stuff like that going on in these in these modern schools. Um, I went to see one of my son's uh, schools, and they're like, this is the place where we come are mindful. And I'm like, oh, great. Brilliant. <laughs> Uh, have, the, have they become woke, the schools, yet? Oh, the schools are the most woke places in the world. You know, how are you going to do that sort of long march through the institutions? The schools are, are doing their level best. Right? Even at that age? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the indoctrination starts early. But fortunately, parents get to unindoctrinate on the, on the way home and teach them how to... I always say to my kids, I don't care what you believe, as long as you can tell me why you believe it. Like, I'm, I encourage you to actively not think what I think. But yeah, I, what I don't like is, uh, and I won't really, I'm not really on board with, is a child coming out with a very large, grandiose statement without evidence to support it. Certainly stuff like kids are often, a lot of kids are, are uh, saying things like Donald Trump is racist. And I, I need evidence. You know, you can't just fling that insult at someone. and it, Because you tell a lie often enough and it becomes the truth, don't you? So what sort of thing are they, have you found, you know, the teachers are telling them that you, you sort of think is woke? It's, well, you know, I've said this before, my eldest son said to me, sorry if this is racist, Dad, but Mum is a better cook than you. So, do you know what I mean? It's like they're, they're, they're learning these words, hyper aware of these words, but they don't really know what they mean. So, um, but schools, uh -huh. are, schools are very, are, are quite lefty institutions as well, aren't they? You know, the education system and, and good because it requires a lot of patience and compassion and uh, understanding and support your fellow human man, which are traditionally very good left wing values. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm quite, I make sure that my kids hang around a load of different views and I, and I sit and I eat with them at the table. And I, you know, and I have friends around and we have open discussions and it's interesting to see what the kids will lob in. So, yeah, they can make up their own minds. It's funny you talk about sort of um, telling them in the car on the way home, you know, not your views, but kind of a different perspective. I did a story recently with The Sun about a, 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 a teacher who was also a Labour councillor who said um, she was worried because of the COVID crisis that t uh, kids were being exposed to far right views from their parents and they didn't have teachers um, to go and correct them on those views, which I thought was pretty scary. Yeah, you know, and you've got to ask yourself why they're keeping the schools closed and all of this stuff, you know. No, I think parents are far right particularly. I mean, anyone who's sort of slightly right of Mao is, a, is an extremist nowadays, aren't they? So, um, yeah, I mean, no, kids should be presented with loads of different views. You know, we, we have to believe and have good faith in the fact that m the vast majority of people are really curious and interested and they love their children and their political views don't really come into it, you know. And people should be able to raise their children free without any of this, uh, without state intervention and stuff like that. I'm very much small government when it comes to that sort of thing. Far right views, brilliant. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's just astonishing, isn't it? I mean, the, one of the um, things, you know, that I wanted to talk about was your experience at school. And I think from what I've read, uh, your experience is probably better than, or oh, sorry, worse than, um, you know, having woke, a few woke teachers. Uh, you went to Harrow School, you know, one of the best schools in the country, if not the world. It's just a, a minute up from the road from my house. Uh, what was that like? Harrow School was, uh, well, we, the, contextually... Uh, it was 1990 when I went, and um, the Child Act hadn't even come in by 1990. It came in in 91, I think. 
So it was extreme culture shock for me. Um, I I was raised in the same way as I raised my kids, which is like having a view and stick by it or talk it out. And um, quite quickly, I mean, I had four teeth smashed out by a boy on the on an iron headboard of a bed very early on. And um, I went to the housemaster with my teeth in my hand. And when this happened, he did it. And the housemaster's like, I'll deal with it. And nothing happened. He got promoted uh, to head to head of house actually the next year. And uh, so it was kind of like that Cambridge academic who was really racist and she's been promoted. The one that likes the dreams of kneecapping white people. Um, and it was pretty horrific. A lot of homophobia, a lot of racism. There was, you know, there was a boy who was summoned to the top table because you'd have top tables where the older boys would sit in their little fiefdom. And uh, he was summoned by the N-word, yeah. So it was, uh, it was horrible. A lot of people might use this, this experience of going to Harrow as um, saying, well, actually, you've got privilege. Um, and, you know, you've obviously come from, come from that kind of background and therefore your opinions on various political matters matter less. What do you make to that argument? Um, I think that everybody has uh, privilege in some way or another um, and some more than others, you know, because essentially we have, as being my skin colour in this country, I have majority privilege, don't I? Because I'm, this 80% of us are the same colour as me. Um, but I think you don't want to have a stay in your lane type way of looking at the world you don't you know otherwise what's what's the benefit of that what are we aiming to achieve by saying you don't understand my lived experience I mean, of course i don't understand your lived experience that's why we have voice boxes brains hearts minds and conversations so that we can begin to understand other people's lived experience but this sort of fencing off of um of what are and aren't privileges and you know this this casting of people as oppression as oppressors and the oppressed only creates division in society. It doesn't, I've not seen a single positive effect of it. You know, it's just, it's as Thomas Sowell said, um, it's just racism under new management. How did Harrow shape your view towards life? I mean, when you left, well, how old were you when you left, by the way? And, and what did you go and do? I mean, you know, going to school, obviously, and, and especially a school like Harrow must have a huge impact on anyone. So how did it kind of change your views and change the way you looked at the world? Well, I left as a very, very entitled young man. People might think I'm still really entitled, which is they're totally entitled to that opinion. Um, and, um, and it took a couple of years of working out how the real world was. But fortunately, I've been state educated before uh, as at my first school experience. Yeah, I left very confused and um, I became a gardener, uh, a sort of labourer gardener for 30 quid a day. Um, and I used to, you know, save up my money and then at the end of the week go out on the lash like everybody else did. So, um, and it took me a couple of years to work out what if, I, if and what I wanted to do. And I'm still kind of in that process now. But I think Harrow probably prepares you better now than it, than it did in the day. But, you know, I did get some, have some amazing things. I had an amazing English teacher who taught me to love language and to really value language. So... Yeah, it's an extreme environment, Harrow was. Not sure what it is now. I read uh, that you said that it was that you were able to play posh roles because of your experience there. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I play a lot of people I know. You know, when I, I mean, I try to lay off the posh roles a bit nowadays because um, I've kind of done it. Um, but obviously, you know, typecasting, casting privilege, all of these stuff. So, um, yeah, if you watch a very... If you watch a, a young man who's got so much money and he's never ever going to have to get a job and work and you watch how they interact with the world it's a, it's a very specific way of dealing with people because they don't really care what other people think of them because they're never going to have to do a day's work in their life they may just the, the biggest work they may have to do in their life is redecorating um dad's 50 room mansion you know when they when dad daddy dies and they inherit it have you seen the film riot club no I mean, this is all about the sort of a Bullingdon Club copy in, in Oxford. Um, and these kids, they go around. It's worth watching, by the way. Uh, it, th these kids, they go around sort of um, doing absolutely horrible things, you know, burning money in front of homeless people and um, things like that. Did you kind of experience that sort of, you know, entitlement from these these boys when you were there? Yeah, 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 yeah. Pe people would um, throw change out the windows at locals when I was there. You go, go and buy your girlfriend something nice. 
You know what I mean? Despicable behaviour. Wow. I mean, the, the kind of, I don't know, it, for me, it's like, I, I can't even get my head in that sort of, you know, empathise with that. I don't, I don't really understand where that comes from. Um, but I mean, walking past Harris School as I do um, every day, almost, uh, fortunately, I don't have anyone throwing any change at me. So I think that uh, hopefully it's changed. Um, how did you get into to acting itself? I mean, because it's a very, you know, a very sort of niche industry and, it, and it's, it's pretty tough. You know, lots of people when their kids want to be an actor. Yeah, everyone wants to be an actor nowadays. I was at drama. Uh, I essentially, I went to, I was rudderless, didn't know what to do with my life was getting pretty bored of being paid 30 quid a day. Uh, and so I thought, I'll audition for drama school. And I auditioned and didn't get in. And that really pissed me off. So that kind of put fire in my belly. So I then said, right, they're wrong. I need to, to get in. And then I got into drama school and then I got a, a film role really just at the beginning of my last year that they were, uh, which I was kind of perfect for. So I was just very lucky. Often it's, it's a combination, isn't it, between um, right place, right time and, and who you are as a person. There's, there's lots of great things that come with coming from an acting family. Like, you know, you are connected in a different way. And I think people probably take a longer look at you than they might if you were Joe Bloggs from the street. But also then on the flip side of that privilege, you have to fight for people to respect you as an artist. So, you know, it's 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 like everybody. Everybody's got that some things that they suffer with, and some hands up in the world, you know, in whatever small or big way. Now, I don't want to sound too much like your therapist, but um, I'm going to, at risk of doing that, I'm going to ask this question. Um, you know, Churchill's experience at Harrow School sounds pretty similar. I mean, I read a book about Churchill a few months ago, but it sounds pretty similar to yours in a way. Uh, he experienced some of the toughest, you know, bullying and teachers hitting him, and you know, his pet. Well, I mean, his parents were absolutely awful to him as well. So, but he sort of took that. Um, that pain in his childhood and all the various sufferings in his life and he turned it around and he really as you say got a bit of fire in his belly and was determined to you know prove everyone wrong do you, do you feel the same do you feel think that the sort of experiences in your early life has really shaped how you view the, view the world and sort of give you a bit of determination uh, in what you do yeah I think I'm, I think everybody's experiences mold them don't they you know it's um in my case I mean Harry was pretty lovely compared to I, I don't think it was that hard compared to what a lot of people have to put up with um but certainly it's uh yeah if you you have a bit of difficulty within a within a if there's a house of 60 boys and you know your your happiness is uh, in the hands of some 17 year old dude who who wants to either make your life hell or heaven depending on whether you make him toast or whether you do what he wants and whether you go and buy his cigarettes for him and you know butter them up in that way um but you know it's i don't think it was that hard you look at these kids uh around where i live and you know they don't they don't even believe in life some of them they don't you know they just they life has dealt them such a shitty hand that they that they you know so i think i've been pretty lucky extremely lucky actually and what about your views? Where did they come from? Mm. Well, I think probably it started... I started listening to the... B, I've always listened to the BBC and I started noticing that it when I was younger and uh, I started noticing that they were starting to say things I really didn't agree with. And then um, it was a slow progress. The, the Brett Kavanaugh hearings, when everyone was suddenly very happy with saying, I don't care whether there's any evidence, you've got to believe Christian Blasey Ford, that's that. And I'm like, absolutely not. Um, that is not the right way to look at a situation. You know, you've got to, the cornerstones of Western society are uh, innocent till proven guilty, you know. And then they just started coming in, in waves, these movements, which I just thought, hang on, we've got to slow down. What, this isn't making any sense. I'm quite a logical person, I think. So, um, you know, and I value our society hugely. So, uh, I, and, I, and I do, I've got really unfashionable views. Like I kind of believe in the nation state. I think it's the best way of organizing people to be nice to each other. And I believe in Western democracy. And I've traveled a bit in the world and I've seen countries where you can't say what you want to say. And uh, it's horrible. So yeah, I think these views come from, from feeling that what we have is worth conserving. It sounds to me like your political um, views are, are, have been quite formed relatively recently, you know, in the last few years, we're talking about the Brett Kavanaugh hearings and things like that. Have you always had these, these, these strong political views? Have you always spoken your mind? And if so, what kind of impact has that had on your career? I mean, you know, you're in White Lines, this, this Netflix, uh, 
you know, huge Netflix series that was filmed last summer. So, uh, you know, has it always, your political views, have they always impacted your acting career? I think they probably have, you know. I certainly haven't um, ever worked for the BBC, for example, so uh, in 20 odd years of acting. So um, I probably don't fit into their ideological standard of what is and isn't acceptable from an artist, or maybe I'm just <laughs> to acting, who knows. Um, <laughs> but uh, they... I'm not sure my views have become more pronounced. I think the society that you interact with has become more polarised. And so what would have been a perfectly reasonable thing to say five years ago is now totally unacceptable. And, you know, you're tainted with this word controversial, which I don't really think my views are particularly controversial, if I'm honest. Um, So, yeah, as far as it affecting my career... Yeah, probably. There's going to be someone who goes, oh, I hate Lawrence Fox, I hate everything he stands for. And, you know, they may be in a position of power in casting or, or, or in production. But you don't know because I don't, I'm not, you know, I don't get the feedback necessarily. I just hear whether I did or didn't get the job. But I like, I'd like to think that I'm a good actor and whatever I think politically has nothing to do with that. That's the world I would think is probably good to live in. Let's say that, you know, for whatever reason, there aren't enough projects to keep food on the table for you or, or, or you know, there's not enough, um, you know, acting jobs around, um, unfortunately, because of, probably because of your, your controversial, some would say, views. Um, would you go down the politics route? Would you ever consider um, becoming a commentator or a journalist or something like that? Um, well, I already do a bit. I mean, I suppose mm. via... Of course, you already do. Uh, I mean, even bit, more. A bit of Twitter, and I, I've written a couple of articles, and I'm really interested in that. Um, I'm definitely interested in trying to create an environment where people can speak freely, and not in, and that not be something that scares people. So um, I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, do you know what I mean? I try not to live in... I'm not a five-year plan type person, I um, much as I admire people that are. I'm a, I'm a bit like, this is your day, live your day, live, live, you know, and don't fuck everyone off. Don't be evil to people. That's my sort of general vibe in life. It's controversial now, you know, but we've got to, we, we have to talk. It's crucial. So hopefully I will work as an actor and, you know, if I end up having to replace Boris, then so be it. <laughs> um, the creative arts industry is one of those really... Fascinating. I mean, I find it interesting just working in the media, um, working, you know, with, with a lot of creative people. Um, you know, we're making videos, we're making or even writing articles in a way is sort of creative. Um, but, you know, generally people, it seems to be an industry that's dominated by the left. Uh, first of all, why do you think that is? And second of all, do you think that um, there's going to be these kind of separate parallel uh, firms and sort of structures where you've got all the right wing uh, actors in one thing and then you've got all the left wing actors in another thing or, or, or how do you see it w- or sort of panning out in the future? Well I really hope not because you don't want a monoculture do you? There, there, are, there are traditional values, uh, left wing values that are really really important around class and financial hardship and stuff like that which, which are great and a lot of theatre is political in that way you know it, it, it's shining lights on different lives so that middle class people like me can go and sit in their overpriced theatre ticket, uh, theatre seat, and be told what to think, you know, and and to be sh- have a light shone on how the other half live. So I can see why it's uh, it's quite a left wing institution, but there also, you know, is still an institution, and there is a national theatre, and that's quite a conservative ish type vibe, isn't it? You know, it's not free to go to the national theatre, is it? Um, so that's a business. Um, no, I think it would be a real shame if you had, uh, you know, just right-wing people. You know, I don't even believe in right-wing and left-wing anymore, actually. I think I believe in authoritarian and anti-authoritarian. And I would definitely put myself in an anti-authoritarian bracket. Some people really want to want to be told what to do and they want the state to look after them. I don't, particularly. But I don't see why that should affect um, one's prospect as an actor I've got a lot of really super left-wing friends my best friend is an ardent socialist we talk all the time you know so it's like I think most people have friends I don't think everyone sort of I don't just hang out with people that agree with me I mean that would be dull I want to very briefly talk about um, a tweet you sent last night Uh, and I think this goes into the kind of discussion we had a bit about uh, privilege Um, you said that you've been sexually assaulted by a famous woman Uh, why did you feel the need to, to say it uh, what you know? What? Why did you tell people that about that experience? 
Well, I was watch. I think I was following the um, Amber Heard Johnny Depp thing, and uh, I think I think you know those wonderful rabbit holes you fall down on Twitter. Mm. And you, end, you end up in some sort of person's world where every man is a is a rapist in waiting, and we're all terrifying. And I was just like, well, you know, I've had something really unpleasant happen to me, and I'm I'm just going to say it can happen to anybody, really. You know, obviously, there's it's much more a, a male to female issue but it's not that it doesn't exist all over the shop and that there are women in positions of power who will really exploit those positions of power is there a double double standard there where you know people are perhaps a bit more sympathetic to the uh the the various minority groups whereas if something terrible happened to a white man or a straight white man for example maybe they, they would be a bit less a bit less uh, sympathetic. Well, there's certainly a. Um, it certainly feels like there is that that, that there is a real. The, the only enemy in the world at the moment is the straight white man, and I suppose that's that's uh, society and culture's way of having a conversation about our past. You know, and there's colonialism, and in America, the the big big problem of uh, you know how they relate to slavery, but. Um, yeah, certainly it feels like, you know, you, you uh, I, I do quite like the fact they call it privilege because you're sort of walking around going, it doesn't feel that privileged. But then they would go, oh, that's awful. You see, you can't even see your own privilege, you fragile white man. Um, so, yeah, you know, I mean, like I said, my best mate is working on a minimum wage job, having lost his other job uh, and, you know, has not had any privilege. So it's just a deeply unhealthy and badly thought out terminology all of it it just doesn't make it's, it's not a good thing it doesn't bring people together it's pointless it's a very odd um you know scenario we're in where people um you know for me it's like it's very difficult you know on a personal level to talk about the bad things that have happened in your life especially if they've been horrific or you know something that's really scarred you and you know you tweeting that was interesting and and um you know some would say quite brave and and but then others might say, well, actually, you're sort of trying to victimise yourself and actually you've had a lot of privilege in your life and, you you know, maybe you shouldn't be talking about those subjects. And um, there's almost this kind of competition as to who can be the biggest victim, you know. Um, and and it, it, So for me, it's like I don't really know what the answer to that is. You know, should, you know, on the one hand, it's very brave of people to talk about the, the terrible things that have happened in their lives, especially if it's really impacted them. Uh, but on the other hand, you do get a, fe- a sense of, well, you know, um, I'm a victim and therefore I sort of, you know, they use that as a sort of a bit of leverage to get one over you uh, on, a, on an argument that you've had to, to make it extremely personal and say, well, actually, because I've had this terrible experience, you, cannot, you can't understand me, you can't understand that and therefore you're wrong. Where I, th- I have that sort of instinct to think, actually, you know, um, I, don't, I don't really accept that as an argument. Yeah, I don't accept it as an argument either. You know, it's, it, what, where, where does the oppression Olympics end? You know, it's like... It's, it's a really divisive strategy. Everyone suffers. Everyone has uh, privilege in certain ways. You know, some more than others. I totally accept that I have a lot of privilege compared to other people. But I've also had some very, you know, I think it's okay to point out, I, I'm in no way trying to victimise myself. If, um, you know, if it had been a bloke who'd done it, what happened to me, I would have knocked him out. So the person that did it to me was uh, lucky to have the female privilege not to have been knocked out for what happened so I, I don't see myself as a victim of it at all I'm just going this happens it does happen it can happen to anybody and um yeah I, 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 I wasn't saying it in order to to come across as a victim I don't feel like a victim I, ever actually I, I don't think it's a, it's a it's a healthy mindset to see yourself as the victim do you think you know there, there are some really interesting figures out there at the moment in the in the intellectual dark web as, as they've been known um you know one of them is jordan peter you know I, I love reading his content and listening to him he's really sort of um you know in, an interesting guy and one of the things that he talks about one of his main messages to to young people especially is to sort of take responsibility in your life um, and once you do that you can kind of have a bit of meaning and a bit of purpose and you know reason to get out of bed in the morning um do you think there's a major issue especially among young people today where a lot of them feel um, rudderless. A lot of them feel that there's not much point to life. A lot of them don't really know, um, you know, why they're here or, or, or have any kind of meaning. And perhaps if they took a bit more responsibility or decided to, 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 to do that, then, um, you know, their life would be a bit better. Well, it's definitely a double-edged sword, isn't it? So young people are growing up much poorer than, you know, my generation, potentially. So therefore, you know, if you're not ever going to be able to afford a house, 
then socialism looks like a great idea, doesn't it? You know what I mean? So I can see it from, from their perspective. But yeah, personal responsibility is, is, is a good thing. It, and meaning is, is, is crucial, I think, you know, and, but with the assault on religion and, and the assault on education and all of these things, then you can see why people feel hopeless. But um, that's also a disease and you need to encourage, you know, you can see the actions and reactions if you choose to, you know, if you choose to do something worthwhile for somebody else and for yourself, you, the repercussions are always very positive often. So, yeah, I feel for them. I feel, you know, the far extremes of it, of, you know, young uh, people with horrible financial situations who don't have their dads around and stuff like that. You can see why these people turn into nihilists and they don't give a shit about the value of life. You can see why. But um, it's really sad. But society has a lot to answer for. We need to, we need to you know, we've had a financial crash. We've now had COVID. We're about to enter a pretty horrific recession I imagine so I'm not sure these these problems are going anywhere which is worrying and sad. You've got kids um, I'm sure a lot of young people are going to be watching uh, this uh, video uh, and hopefully you know a lot of parents too so first of all how, how are you going to um, you know make sure that your kids don't fall into that nihilistic trap how are you going to support them um, in that way and you know if you're a young person now watching this video what would you say to them who sort of feels a bit down and feels that they don't have any meaning or purpose in their life? I think to my kids, I, it starts with manners, weirdly. So I am um, pretty hot on manners and behaviour and putting other people uh, ahead of yourself, which I think is very rewarding. You know, it's as far as, you know, if you choose to get your dopamine hits from likes on Twitter, uh, then those dopamine hits are probably not going to be as meaningful and as real. But if you, you can actually get your dopamine hits from, from having a positive influence on other people and, and showing love, to other people and love can often be quite a painful thing to to do you know it's not always just telling everyone that they're wonderful and you know not molly coddling them but i think you know young people are that it feels like a spasm it doesn't feel like a chronic condition and i think you know young people are going no there is we, we're going to fight for a better future and there is a small subsection of those people that are like my life is miserable, I'm going to make everyone else's life miserable. Nihilistic, horribleness. But manners is important. My kids, uh, my kids said to me the other day, why are you not uh, hard on me when we're at my dad's house? And I said, because you behave so much better than when you're at my house. So, you know, he, uh, it's a training thing with, with kids. You know, what do you want to throw out into the world? You want to throw out a bunch of people that uh, want their own way and are spoiled as hell. You know, that's, I wasn't raised that way. I think you want to, kids want to go out to the world saying, what can I offer you? What have I got to bring to you? Which will be, which is good and loving and, and proper. Do you worry about the impact of social media on them? I mean, obviously you've had a pretty tough time in terms of the kind of vile abuse and death threats and things like that being sent your way. Does it worry you, you know, that they're growing up in this world where all they've ever seen is kind of lived in this virtual world and, 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 and let's, and let's also be nuanced about this. I mean, the internet is a, an absolutely wonderful thing. They've got access to literally endless information um, about the world that, you know, you probably didn't have when you were growing up. So does it worry you the kind of, you know, the access to the social media and the nastiness that they have? Yeah, but it's a reality, right? That, that's a reality, you know, it, it's going to create a lot of uh, problems. I, I suppose, interestingly, you know, like the, this body positivity movement, possibly comes around because you know the more people are sharing pictures and videos of each other the more they realize we're not all one shape and size you know so I suppose what you want to do is find out what are the positive aspects of social media which can help which is often about messaging and saying it's okay in my case it's like I use social media as a way of going I can say I'm going to be free in my expression on social media but yeah I'm, I worry but it's it's a reality for them isn't it and uh, you there's definitely rising anxiety amongst young people and I feel for them I wouldn't want to be constantly plugged in all the time it's you know and I mean, I kind of am, but I, ch I take some time away from it sometimes, just not at the moment because it's too much fun. Absolutely. I mean, it's important to read books and, and do other things and not always be in, involved in that virtual world. Um, 
Uh, I want to talk about Prince Harry and Meghan to finish off the interview. Uh, Prince Harry has been releasing a lot of videos, some people calling them hostage videos, uh, saying, for example, the Commonwealth is a, you know, has had lots of issues in the past and it's time for us to sort of atone for that. What do you think is going on with Harry and Meghan? Um, I think Meghan is, is very ideological, it would seem. And uh, I think Harry is possibly the perfect um, co-conspirator in that thing you know because he's obviously had a horrific time as a young man you know being forced to walk behind his mother's coffin I mean wow and you know he seems to be an extremely genuinely compassionate person and um, I think that it, you like with all bad relationships these things can be codependent can't they so it seems to me that Megan has a desire to tell us all what to do and what to think and that Harry is got is in a difficult position because he's either on board with his wife, who's married, and you you know that you you need to work as a partnership if you're married, and uh, I I feel he's sort of stuck. But it's uh, it, I I don't like being lectured to by them, uh, certainly not about stuff that they don't seem to know much about. Certainly, see with the Commonwealth, the Commonwealth is a voluntary organisation that it brings people together. You know, you, you're not forced to be in the Commonwealth. It's not the British Empire. And um, it, the British Empire is something totally different. And yeah, there is a conversation that needs to be had about that. But, you know, I've seen, you've, you must have friends. I've had friends where I've, they've gone off and got married and you're like, I don't know you anymore. And I think there's a sort of overwhelming national feeling of like, what happened to Harry? But at the same time, I wholeheartedly think he's amazing to, to support his wife and, and get on board with it. I just, he doesn't look massively comfortable doing it and there's something so irritating about being patronized to by you know someone like me with this uh with this issue they're talking about you know history and and obviously britain's history is deeped in in, in a lot of darkness um with the empire and, and various things that you know you, you could point to and say you know that was wrong if you look at it from today's standards should we be ashamed of our history it's not our, it's not our history is it it's history it doesn't belong to us you know it's and also you know, let's be balanced about it and think of some of the great things that we've done in terms of transportation across the world, trade across the world, all of these sorts of things. But we're in a very negative mindset at the moment where we hate ourselves and, uh, you know, well, I'm not, but a lot of people are, and they want to tear everything down. And it's like, no, sorry, it's not, it's not good. Yeah, there are things that we can talk about in terms of colonialism, but also let's have a conversation about slavery and it's ongoing slavery at the moment, but that doesn't kind of fit into the uh, woke agenda in the same way as, um, you know, talking about Islam doesn't really fit into the woke agenda particularly either. And, um, you know, it's, we're all hoodwinked into this, uh, you know, you're not allowed to say certain things, it's controlling the language, it's, it's dodgy. Do you think it's almost your mission in a way to... Um to speak out against these issues that you see, you know, are taking over the West, this kind of destructive attitude towards our history and our culture. Do you feel it's your sort of little personal, you know, I've got to, I've got to stand up against this? I, I didn't actually until I started getting really attacked and then and I started to worry for my livelihood and I was like, well, actually, then I've kind of got to push through because I don't think these are particularly controversial views. And if I can offer my small bit and say, I'm not going to be cowed by you nasty little vitriolic bullies, um, then I can do it. Th then I think I should, because I, w I do want a more inclusive culture. I don't want a culture where we're terrified to speak and we're all in a little Stasi state, which essentially is where we're kind of heading at the moment. So not so much a, a mission, more a, a situation that I find myself in. I mean, if I could go back in time, would I have gone on question time? Don't know, no. Is that that seriously? You wouldn't you wouldn't do it? You really really that's a, that surprises me. I I think I would, but if someone had said to me, um, just so you're clear, your life is going to be totally thrown up in the air for six months, you know, and I'd just come off doing a lovely job, and I was like, oh cool, you know, and I'm not sure that any of this attention is like pro acting career, is it? It doesn't feel like it's like, oh, this is really an extra string to your bow, chum. Um, were there friends who are messaging you saying nasty things? I know that sometimes this can happen as well. You sort of lose friends over, over that stuff. Um, I've I had I've I had a couple of quite passive aggressive conversations, but um, me being me, I will go, okay, what about this? So I take on board what you're saying, and what about this? And usually people don't. 
they, they, you know, activists aren't interested in conversations, they're interested in activism. So they, they come to you with their great sweeping statement of how wonderfully compassionate they are. And if you just go like that with a pin, punk, into the balloon, gently, and say there are, there is another, there's a multi-layered understanding of a situation that isn't indoctrinated and orthodox in the way that you're presenting it, then, um, yeah, it can, can create problems. But it's a very specific type of person that does that. And they tend not to be interested in other people's opinions. And, you know, you just go, well, I'm interested in yours. Let's be interested in each other's. And on that positive note, thanks so much, Lawrence Fox, for joining us. Thanks, Steve.